Good evening, everybody. My name is Jeff Simone. I am the co-host of the Commonwealth Conservative (laughs) Podcast. (laughs) He is the host with the most, who doesn't need to brag and doesn't need to boast, Sean Dooley. Sean, how are you today? Uh, Not bad. Not bad. How are you, Ben? You have a good week? I had a great week. Uh, Good to be back here in the studio with you. We have a very special guest with us today. We We have... Colonel Julie Hall retired from which branch of the uh, service? United States Air Force. United States Air Force. Wonderful to be with us today. Thank you so much, Julie, for joining us. Uh, Sean, you know, you are running for office and Julie is running for office, and it's a critical time. We're just days away from the election. Um, You know that you are in the thick of it. She is in the thick of it. What are you feeling How can you sympathize with Julie? It's it's 10 days out. It's the most relaxing time of the entire campaign. You're just, there's no stress. You're not worrying. You're not second guessing. You know, no one's telling you these crazy reports, anything like it's, 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 it's almost like you're on vacation. It's, it's like you're out of spot. Um, No, as as, as I, I, and I, and I joke, it's, it it is, um, I was talking to a first time candidate yesterday and, you know, and I felt bad because, you know, he's just doesn't have a lot of advisors. And just absolutely, oh my God, they said this, and then this person did this. And I'm like, nope, final two weeks of the campaign, all the BS, all the nonsense comes flooding out. You have all your emotions working. You've put so much into it. You're exhausted. You haven't been sleeping. And it's it's so close to be over, but you're, you've got so much more to do, and you're trying to cram it all in, and you're getting all sorts of advice. And, and it, it, it is... It is until you've done it, you can't you can't express it. Um, it's one of these things. You know, from an outsider, I'd managed a ton of campaigns, um, and uh, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, I get it, I get it. Till you're the candidate, and it's your face out there, and and it's your personality and your belief system and who you are as a person that either they're attacking or making things up about, or you know, or telling you, well, you should have done this and you should have done that. You you can't comprehend it. So. Thank you for running, for especially for Congress. It's such a huge, huge thing. So um, before we get started, I do have a, a we. I try to give away a piece of swag every time. We we oh. we, we ran out of our Commonwealth Conservative um, face masks. So I've got you know since it's a since it's a presidential year, um, I have our our Dooley twenty twenty uh, t shirt. Excellent. Um, so with 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 a name like Dooley, I have the two O's there. Um, I won't be able to use this design again until 2030, so I, I figured I would get it out. My presidential, <laughs> camp- my, my presidential campaign did not right. quite take off the way I wanted to, but I had the logo. So, um, so, and, and we we are social distancing, so I yep. will uh, toss go. it toss it way over way right. over there onto the other side of the studio. And um, so, without me rambling on, okay. Colonel Julie Hall, the uh, let's. Tell, tell tell the audience a little bit about yourself, sure. why you're running, some of your background, things along those lines. Sure. Thank you. And thanks for having me, Rep. Dooley and uh, Jeff. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So I will tell you a little bit about myself. I came, I, I actually grew up in a beautiful little town not far away from here called Walpole, Massachusetts. So this is where I was raised. I have six brothers and sisters, and I, you know one of my sisters. Yep. So I had a very large family, and so I tell people I'm a, I am a fiscal conservative. When you have a large family like that and you're middle class, you learn how to stretch a buck from the very beginning. So I believe that that was the, my first beginnings of how I was going to look in terms of money. That kind of, kind of sets the stage. The other thing is being from a large family, I also had parents that worked. My father worked two jobs. My mother was a nurse. She used to come home at 7 o'clock in the morning, just getting off her night shift from the hospital to get seven little halls off to school. So I remember that, and I remember my parents working very, very hard and, you know, to, to make sure that we had food on the table and everybody had what, they, what we needed to have. So for me, and I think in a lot of families, being a female in the family... Uh, We had boys there, and those were the ones that were going to go to college. So I was kind of out there on my own, even though my parents would have loved to send all of us. So I started working when I was 14 years old. I worked at, and this is where I get get myself dated here a little bit, I worked at Sullivan Stadium, 
I don't know how many people. There, there you go. <laughs> even remember Sullivan Stadium. Uh, so I worked there, and after that, I went to Massasoit Community College. So right here, I'm a community college girl right here in, in uh, Massachusetts. I'm a huge fan of community college. I went to several universities, and I rem remember more from Massasoit than any That's other. That's awesome. Yeah, so we have great schools in Massachusetts, and I, I really, um, I'm really proud. I'm very proud of Massachusetts. And when I was in, and I, as I moved on past Massasoit, I went in for two, to get an associate's degree in human resources, and then I went into the military. And it was 1978. I, and there were very few females in the military at that time. And then even fewer that stayed on for a career. So being in an all-male uh, dominated career field, it was very difficult as I made my way through. I think the, the one thing, and you, you see this going on right now with um, you know, the Supreme Court uh, the Supreme Court discussions of you know, a women still having to prove her competency. It, it's a little disturbing sometimes to see this after so many years because I think all through my career, that's one of the things I've had to do. I was always challenged on my competence. And, you know, I can tell you to this day, I must have done pretty damn good because I started at the very bottom as an airman and made it up to colonel. So wow. you don't get to go that far um, if you're not a competent person who knows how to lead and have a lot of experience. So I'm very, very proud of my military career and, and what, uh, you know, what transpired there. You know, you, one of the things you get with a military career is you get experience and you get leadership and a lot of that leadership is in foreign policy. You have to know what's going on. So um, that kind of took you through a couple of years right there into where I am right now. As soon as I got out of the military, I started serving again. I started on my planning board um, in Attleboro, in the city of Attleboro, and then I ran for, uh, um, I ran for the counselor at large position, which I did get, and I stayed on there for a couple of terms. Then I ran for state rep, and uh, that was a tough one. That was a tough one. The, the Democrats really wanted that seat bad, right. very, very badly, and they, they bar you know, that was, and you talk about all the tension that goes on in a race. That was the race, I think, that I learned the most from, because they did, and I say steamrolled, they steamrolled me. They came in. They brought union people from outside. You know, but I have to say, it was very, very nice, because oh. a lot of them, even though they weren't from Attleboro, were coming up and introducing themselves to me. And I thought, this is interesting. These people are here helping my um, opponent, but yet they want to meet me. It, it made me feel good on one hand, but it, it got me, it's peculiar peculiar what happens in politics. And I think one of the difficulties that I've found that's most disturbing to me is your friends. To me, you know, being a military person, friendship is friendship. Loyalty is loyalty. I don't care what party you're in. I don't care what's going on. That's the way it should be. And I think if we, we've gotten away from that and people have kind of made politics a blood sport, <laughs> And, and, you know, an I got you moment. And I wish we would get away from that because after these things are over with and you start seeing people back on the street again, they're great. They're waving at you like nothing ever happened. So, you know, I, that's one of the things I, I, I really hope people will get away from and, and stop demonizing their, their opponents. I know sometimes we have differentiating opinions for sure, but there's, you know, there's got to be some civility as we, as we go through this. And I think people are getting very tired of seeing people being very nasty to each other and really just want to talk about the issues. So, um, oh, there you go. We just lost a little light here. It's all right. Where is it unplugged? Did it unplug? That's the light, not the camera. Yeah, so this one's here to here. We'll cut it this out. It's the one on the left. It be, yeah. yeah. Uh, don't move the camera too much. Not to. Here we go. There we go. Okay, move it to just to the left a little bit. Here, I'll there, just tell me. keep going right there. Perfect. Beautiful. Okay. 
we'll edit that out in post. You know, we're not a professional organization That's just yet. <laughs> we're, we're still working on it. So, right. All right, good. So, you grew up in Attleboro. I grew up no, in Walpole. 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 You live, where do you live now? In Attleboro? In Attleboro Jeez, now. I'm getting everything wrong today, Sean. That's right. I, I got to wake up. And just gonna say, it's a Friday night. You started drinking, drinking around noon. Uh, you know, you're it's the only one drinking it's, it's, here. It's, it's, it's the day drinking. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I work today, but uh, okay. So you grew up in Walpole. You live in Attleboro now. That's correct. And um, you know, you ran for state rep, uh, and now you're running for United States Congress. So tell, what's the difference you're seeing between the campaign you um, for rep and and Congress, and what are you hearing from the people in the district? You know, I think the thing that's different for me, I personally think. There's so much at stake in this particular race for Congress. And people always ask me, always get asked the first question, why did you run? And I tell you there's a couple of reasons. The first reason is my patriotism and my love for the United States of America and my love for the flag. I mean, I spent 30 years of my life serving this country, and now I'm continuing to serve the country. I couldn't think of a more, a better time for me to really step up to the plate and everything that I've learned, all my background, has sort of culminated, I think, to this one time. This is the best time, if I was going to run, the best opportunity. I have the most passion for this right now. And I think that's what it takes. You have to have a passion that you're doing the right thing and doing it for the right reasons. Again, everybody's going to have differing opinions, but your passion has to be that you're doing the right thing. So that's the first reason. The second thing is, historically, there has never been, or I don't want to say never, but there has not been, a, first of all, a Republican that's run for this, um, or won, been won, basically, in this seat. It's been occupied by Democrats all the time. There's um, always been somebody from either Newton, Wellesley, or Brookline. And I say, well, there's the rest of us. There's the lower 31 is what I call the rest of the district. And we have a much different life down here. And I explain that, you know, where we have people that are working two and three jobs trying to get their kids through school. It's different. These people have different needs. They have different things that are important to them. That I think people that are up in, um, and, and there's nothing, you know, wrong with being in Brookline, Wellesley, or Newton. But sometimes when, you're, when you have that much affluence, it's, it's very difficult, almost impossible to understand what it's like to go through what most of the people down here and the working class people go through. So I wanted to be able to represent those people. And I don't have to pretend that I'm one of them. I grew up here. I am one of them. And I think that is important, and that message is resonating with people out in the district right now. Right. Well, I was going to say, because I mean, the district, it's really gerrymandered. It starts for the 4th Congressional District. It starts at... Brookline and then kind of winds its way, you know, snakes its way down all the way, you know, into, you know, Millis and then, you know, into Franklin and then over to North Attleboro and then down into, uh, you know, over, over to Taunton and down to Fall River. I mean, it's kind, oh, kind of takes a very it. circuitous route uh, that they kind of carved up to create Absolutely. this, uh, you know, to, to anchor it with the northern part and, well, to, and to kind of basically take out the southern half, you know, to, to lose, lose the importance of all of us down on this end who Absolutely. are a little, I shouldn't say we're a little more, a little different. We're very different. Very I different. Mean, we're di very Sean, different. Is your, is your whole district inside the fourth? No. Okay. No, a large chunk of it yeah, is. Yeah, I was going to say four out of my six towns are. Four out of six. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're very, very, very different. And, um, you know, I, I tried to figure out how did this happen? And then I got a pretty good idea. So there was a, conglomeration, I'll say, of Democrats up in that area. So the majority of the votes for a person who's going to run in Brookline, Wellesley, or Newton, is going to come right from those three towns. Right. And if you look, you know, the rest of us down here, now it tends to be a little bit more conservative as, as you move down in this direction. But that was the whole idea of, and I think um, the difficulty has been that when people run for this, they automatically assume that if it's somebody from Brookline, Wellesley, or Newton, that they've won the district. The media 
has even treated it that way. And the media is very liberal, and the media is protecting my opponent. And right from the beginning, it was Jake Auchincloss and the Republican. <laughs> right. <laughs> it seems to be a pattern. Yeah, no, is it, oh, and, 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 it, and it's funny from the standpoint of Jake is now this super liberal progressive. Yeah. But when I first met him, he was actually, when he got out of the Marine Corps, he was working for us. He was on our victory team. Yes. And then he was Mr. Gung-Ho Republican and all of a sudden decided it's Massachusetts. So I'm going to reinvent myself. I'm going to move to Newton. I'm going to reinvent myself. And all of a sudden, he became this ultra-liberal. And you're just like, all right, well, which one is it? That's correct. Were you, are you the conservative Marine who I met you know, six years? It's not, and this isn't like... There's been huge life events where he's got married and had had kids and you know ha, you know had a, a great tragedy or or there's something significant in his life. This is purely opportunistic Correct. in so much that well I'm going to you know to Massachusetts the best way to win I want to be a congressman right. the best way to win is yeah I'll just change the narrative I'll change my you know my spin I'll pretend I was never this you know right-wing conservative <laughs> and you know and whenever anyone asks well, oh yeah no i just did that as a job but i'm like you don't change that much correct so you're either disgenuine you know disgenuous then or you're correct. lying now i mean it's one or the other and he's playing and, and, and i guess that's one of the things that well, bothers me is that he's it feels like he's playing a role he's not you know i want my representative whether I agree with them or disagree with them, to be genuine. Agreed. You know, I, and I say this, um, you know, pick a lane. Mm. Pick a lane and stay with the lane. And, you know, the way I look at it, and again, I'm going to go back. He's military. I'm military. A military officer makes a decision and is convicted to that ideology and goes in that direction. You don't flip-flop. You don't, in, in a short period of time, you don't change your ideologies that much. That just is not going to happen. So, you know, I do see it as being disingenuine. I do see it as an integrity issue. And I, I can tell you that people in the district, they're seeing it too. I call him a flip-flopper. He's a flip-flopper, okay? He went from being a Republican to an independent and then to a Democrat in the, in the matter of six years. So, I mean, it doesn't really take a lot of... Uh, thought process for people to figure out um, what happened and, and where this guy is. When people say, well, what does he stand for? I said, to be honest with you, I really don't know today. I don't know today. And I, even the media, again, the liberal media who's trying to protect him, and realize what's going on, has tried to now paint him as a moderate, which is very interesting because he called himself a pragmatic um, progressive. So very, very interesting that he's... Well, that was during the primary. So he had to... Correct. He all of a sudden shifted his stripes yet again. So yes, he did. every So you know, whatever is... And, and granted, politicians do this, you know, and, and I think that's one of the problems in our country is that you know, I would rather have someone with the courage of their convictions. Yes. You know, I, I always say it. I'm like, I'd rather lose for what I believe in than win for what I don't believe in. Correct. And and I and I know that's you know, that's the reason I like you, reason I endorse you. Um, it really and we need more of that in our country. You just you don't have to look far. You look to Washington and you know they're all whores. They will do and say whatever they need to to get elected. There's very few people that are truly convicted in in their principles down there and they'll 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 spin and they'll whoa oh, whoever has the biggest check they're buying them yeah. and and if, if you can't have basic convictions and basic um, things that you believe in at this stage of the game wait till you get in Washington DC with all the money and the power and Absolutely. all the flash and the glory, and when you get hooked into that, you know, you get that beltway fever. Look out if you can't if you can't handle it now. Correct. It ain't going to get better once you get yeah. down there. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's sort of the message is that this is a gentleman that just can't make up his mind. He he's going. He is an opportunist. You know, he is young. I'll say that he is young, and 
you know, but that's no excuse. If you're ready to run for Congress, you're ready to run for Congress. And in my opinion, he's... I don't know much about him. How old is he, you know? He's in his 30s, I believe. Does he have family, married kids? Yeah, he's got a couple. I think he's got, I think he's got children. Okay. And he's married. Um, you know, so, but he's still, the way, you know, he carries himself is, it's not a lot of, I don't see the maturity there. I just don't see the ability, as, as Sean was saying, to be able to not be swayed. He goes right down the party line. Everything Joe Biden says, he's saying. So it's, it's fa- he's following the narrative to the T. It would be nice if he showed a little bit more thought process of his own. I don't, and I think that, you know, I don't want to, boy, I don't want to tell him how to run, run his campaign because then he'll, he'll uh, uh, improve. You need every vote you can get. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Better. <laughs> Just I don't want to give him the hints, but, but the, the thing is, is uh, I'd have to say the majority of people, even Democrats, have mentioned, and my brother is helping me on my campaign, and my brother's an independent. And he's learned, even heard from his Democratic friends, and they say the term, they don't like him. That's what they say. They right. don't like the way he handles himself. They don't feel that he is genuine. Uh, they just comes across very smug. Elitist is the best word I can use. Right. And, and you know, and he is. He is an elitist. He comes from a very, very affluent and famous family. I did a Google search on him a few, when he won because I didn't know much about him. Yeah, his family. Yes, is like I believe it's like Mayflower family, He's right? He's the Kennedy. He's another. Yeah, Kennedy. yeah. It's okay. th- it goes way, way, back, way, way back, way back. Yeah. yeah. So, so here it is, a gentleman that's been told probably all the way along the line. This is your, you know, you can have everything you want, you can do everything you want, but you know what I say? You don't get to buy this district. You're not going to buy this seat. And the people of this district, this is, this is their seat. They want somebody who's going to be a voice for them. And that's coming out loud and clear. You know, Kennedy was here for a while, and, you know, he's gone. And I think that was a direct message to, that says, listen, we don't want this anymore. So now we've got, we've got another one, another Kennedy, um, again, very affluent, that I think in, in the, the smugness is saying, you know, listen, I don't have to go out there and campaign. I don't, I don't see many signs out there. Right. No, no. Yeah, he's, he's done, I mean, from a, from a rep that represents a big chunk of his district, he hasn't been down. He hasn't visited. I haven't heard of, he hasn't called me, um, you know, and, and it, which is funny because, I mean, you know, Joe Kennedy and I were friends. I mean, and, and, and whenever he would come into my district, even when he was first running, he would call me and be like, you know, listen, I know we're on, you know, different size and different party, but you're the rep down there. I just wanted to make sure you, you knew I was there. If there's anything you need while I'm here, let me know. Haven't heard boo out of him. And it's, it's, it's disappointing that, you know, our district has been so gerrymandered that they can take it our whole half of the district or two-thirds of the district, basically take it for granted because they've designed enough votes out of Brookline and Wellesley and that northern little section that's going to vote 90% Democrat, mm-hmm. that's enough to actually win, which is, which is very, very frustrating that if the rest of this district goes, you know, you, know, you, could, you could win you know, 75% of the towns and still lose because the way they've stacked this, uh, the deck against you. That's correct, and that's, that's exactly right, and that's what's disappointing. And, you know, and who, who gets hurt by all of this? The people, you know. So to me, that's, it, that's why I'm saying the, the passion that I have for this to happen, and everybody's behind this, and, and it is, has to be. And I tell people, I'm one vote. I can't win this seat. I know that. I cannot win this. It is not my seat to win. It is the people's seat to win. They have to be behind it. They have to want this seat just as bad as I do then they have to get out and vote. So that's something I learned from my other campaigns, too. You learn very, very quickly. It's not about you. No, not, 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 not if you're doing it the right way. Right. But, un, but unfortunately, with the gerrymandering and, and the way they play these games, they get to basically pick and choose their air. And the Democratic machine gets to say, all right, well, this... Rich guy, we've decided he's going to be our next 
person. And so we're going to place them in there as if it's almost fait complete. I mean, they, they, there's, he's not running a campaign. He's not advertising. He's not down here. He's not doing anything because he doesn't need to. Why waste the time? Because I'm better than that. I don't have to go deal with these peasants and grovel for my votes because I am, you know, I am, I am democratic royalty, and therefore, you know, therefore everything should be handled. But how nice would it be to be able to actually have, you know, a colonel in the military and someone that we actually know, and you know, you see around town at the coffee shop that you can actually have that person as your as your representative. So a when you person. have an issue, you can call them. <laughs> A real person. A real person. You can actually call them and talk to them and maybe not always agree, but actually have that discussion and conversation. I mean, that, that would be huge. And, you know. It, it yeah. would send a really, really good message. And I'm not saying it because of me. I'm just saying this is the message that people, they need to know there's hope. They need to know that the average person can do it. it you know, there's a couple of things that keeps the average person from being able to run money is a big thing. Now, I, I have a pension. I worked very, very hard uh, in the military, and I made a lot of good decisions. So I do have a pension, so I'm able to run and, and able to put up a little seed money to start of my own. But I can't put up the thousands. And I, I mean, I even heard that there were you know, half a million dollars that some, some of these 11 Democrats. Now, let me tell you something. That's a very interesting concept. How come there were 11 Democrats running? The Republicans would never do that. They always have somebody in the queue ready to go. Right. So that should tell you one thing. They weren't prepared. They were not prepared to take this seat. So 11 people jumped in to run for this seat from the Democratic side. The good thing is they all had to spend their money and I'm sure that Mr. Auchincloss had to spend a lot of his money, too, to get through the primary. The other thing is, this was not the Democrats' candidate, from what I understand. They wanted Jesse Murmel. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, and so, you know, Jesse was the one that I believe that they wanted to see come through. That was their champion. So this was not their first choice. Jesse either. was Twitter's candidate. Oh, okay. So... A lot, lot of a lot of people were upset when uh, she didn't win, and cried foul because you know well, <laughs> she was expected to win on Twitter, but Twitter's not real life. No, exa exactly. That, that's one thing people do after is social media is not real life. No, not at all. <laughs> but I think in terms of that, I think I believe, and I've watched it. I lot of watched a lot what, that was what was going on, and I really feel that Jesse was also minimalized by Jake, just as I'm being minimalized, minimized. Excuse me. Now. And, and you know what? And for me, all right, if you do it to me, you're not really doing it to me. You're doing it to the district. And so exactly what you said is correct. What you're saying to the district is you don't have to go out and vote. Your vote doesn't count. Well, that's a horrible message to be given to people. That's a horrible message. And even, and I've learned also, even if you're not running against anybody, you still get out there and put your signs out. Right. Because you let people know that you want the job. Yeah, you want them to vote for you in the affirmative. Right, exactly. Both of I mean, whether, no, you know, and both of you know that, even right. whether you had an opponent or not. Right. Um, is, has this seat ever had a woman? I mean, I know before Kennedy, it was Barney Frank, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure. Who I don't know who before that. Who before, I mean, Barney Frank had it Can for 20-something yeah. years. An important thing here, I, Sean, I don't know if you noticed this. Now, I did. Um, I, I, I'm not aware, and please correct me, I believe every congressional candidate that we have in Massachusetts on the Republican side, maybe, maybe it's not every, but certainly five out of six or four out of five is a woman. Am, I, cor am I correct yeah. on that, Julie? We have the most women running in the Republican race. I mean, when they talk about, they talk about, the, um, and even um, Elise Stefanik said this, that there's a lot of women now running um, in for Congress and the and that Massachusetts funny was, how, contributing, funny. was contributing the right. most to this. Funny how no media have picked up on that fact. Right. The, the fair media who's constantly focused on what category Gender we all fit equality? into. Yeah, they're all... Identity yeah, politics? Yeah, identity yeah. politics well, and, is neglecting oh, I, them. They're all, they're all Republican, but they're yeah, all... Right. And, and the, the one man we have running is, is gay. gay. I mean, so, I mean, so, so we're this 
ultra, we're the old rich white guy party, but we've got, <laughs> you know, you know, all of our candidates, you know, are, are you know, five women, and, you know, one of whom's African American. Uh, I don't know, you know, necessarily, you know, the, you know, the, the, you know, race of everybody, but you know, and then and then John Paul Moran is is a gay guy, yes. you know, very openly, you know, yes. you know, probably you know, probably gay, but it doesn't he doesn't make it part of his campaign. It's just who he no. is, um, and. Where the nobody's writing about it. There's, nobody's there's, talking. There's, no about one's it. talking about it. There's no. And we you know. have talked about this as candidates about how amazing it was for all of us to be running, and how absurd it is that nobody's given us the time of day. Why? Because we're in Massachusetts. I can't tell you how many times I've heard. You know, I tried to call around to different people and say, "Hey, listen. Um, you know, I'd like an endorsement." From, there's some military groups out there. Well, where are you from? Massachusetts. <laughs> okay. You know, and, and people said, well, you're from Massachusetts. You know, my answer to that is, well, they haven't met me yet. Okay? They have not met Colonel Julie Hall yet. I mean, I have, I have done things that people have said were impossible, and I have done them. So, you know, I, I, I don't listen to the polls. I tell people on my team, I don't care what the polls say. I don't care what other people say. We're winning this race. We're going to win this race, and we're going to do the, our very, very best that we can. Because I think, I believe, you're just buying right back into that narrative again that the Democrats want you to believe. They want you to believe you can't win here. Right. Well, we can. We can win here. It's 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 interesting that you know our entire congressional delegation is is um, Democrats and. It's funny. I heard a great saying the other day, and I and I, and I, I apologize for I forget who said it. It was a television commentator. Uh, basically, uh, Massachusetts very democratic, but we like having a little bit of balance. Yes. We we traditionally have a Republican governor to go with the hardcore Democratic legislature, and you would think. And I think the 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 way she put it, she goes, Massachusetts really likes having their blue cake. But they also like having that red candle, and it's like, and I'm like, and I'm like, oh, what a great way to phrase it yes, from the yes. standpoint of we we want to have some level of balance, and so f just purely from a pragmatic standpoint, you know, no matter who's in the White House, no, no matter who's in the majority, you want to have some balance Absolutely. for your state. So if there's something going on, you have a voice on bo both sides, right. as opposed to. Especially if the you know, even if the Republicans aren't in the majority, they're not going to be in the super minority. You know, you know, maybe they're going to have forty-eight uh, percent. You know, you know, of something. You want to have those people with you, and if you don't have a voice to go into that caucus and say, "Hey, listen, this is important. We're 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 fighting for this for Massachusetts. This will help me, and this will help our entire country, and this is why." They don't even get to hear that side. So they're only in the echo chamber. And to be able to have just even one voice on the other side to bring some balance, that would be so huge. And, and it would bring more revenue back to Massachusetts. It'll bring more Absolutely. jobs back to Massachusetts. All the way across the board, every single state, if you look at the states that have a balanced legislative body, they're much better taken care of mm -hmm. by the Congress who controls the purse strings. Well, I think that I think that you hit the nail nail on the head right there. Balance. I, I honestly believe, and I've, you know, I do a lot of research. That's one thing I'm known for. I used to walk into my city council with stacks and PowerPoint slides. I think that's the military background in me. Um, but I do a lot of research. I read a lot. And so, um, you know, I do. I did actually my first article that I read had to do with the underrepresentation in the House of the middle class, believe it or not. Somebody wrote a whole paper on it, and they said that even race and gender has outpaced socioeconomic status. And I just thought to myself, I, I intuitively thought that, but now there's a paper that says, a white paper that says this. So um, I just thought that was very, very interesting. So you do need some balance from a lot of areas. You do need balance of gender. You do need balance of political ideologies. You do need balance of, you know, I, I you know, I'm trying to think if the military people in there. I think that's there's a lot more military people going in into the 
you know, into Congress. So you need the balance. I do believe that the forefathers, that's, what they, that's where they based all of this, on the premise that there would be balance. Right. I really believe that, because now that we're unbalanced, you could see when people say, how come it's so divisive? Well, it's so divisive because we're unbalanced right now. I believe that to be true. And once we get that balance back again, I have absolutely no problems um, when two people, you know, when you, when you get two different opinions. You know who wins when you get two different opinions? The people win. Right. So what are you, what are you hearing from the people as far as what they're concerned about out there in the district? What's the, what are the number one issues? I mean, I, I would think in right now, the recording of this episode, I would imagine coronavirus is th the top issue, but maybe it's not. So, uh, you know, you're closer, you're out there campaigning. We all have to socially distance and stay in our houses and go from our car to our house. So I'm not out there amongst the people like when, back when I campaigned. But tell me, what are you, what are you seeing out there? What are you hearing sure, from everybody? Okay. I mean, I think with coronavirus, I mean, I don't want to say people have gotten, gotten used to it, but they sort of see it as a, they see it as a necessary nuisance. And that's the best way I can, can put it. You know, is it a, a real predicament? Yes, it is. There, there are people, I, I believe this is a special kind of virus, and this virus is going through people that maybe have a little weaker immunity very, very quickly, quicker than any other virus has. However, I've worked in a hospital for 26 years of my life. I've been around infections <laughs> all the time. I, try, I tell people that I've probably caught every disease you could probably, possibly yeah, as you move away, right? There's, 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 well, we're, we're still socially distant. A little more social distance. There's six uh, feet here, and then, <laughs> at least. You know, I, who knows what they shot into my arm in the military? So, right. you know, these things. I have seen us go through these things before. This is not the first time I've seen something like this. This is the first time where I feel that we have allowed this virus to overcome our. I'm going to say common sense is what I'm going to say, all right? I think that you can still be distancing. I think that you can still be protecting yourself. But you have to go on with life. One of the things that we're going to see here that people don't talk too much about is, and, and it's already happening, the mental health issues that are starting to spring up with children. Right. Mm -hmm. With children. Because this being around their friends are so important. And children already that have special needs are finding it even more difficult. This is very unusual for them. They like, you know, they like right. a, you know. A they nice need schedule. the structure, yeah. Absolutely. So I'm very disturbed about that. And I think that we need to do the best we can to normalize. And people say, I, if I hear that word new normal again, I think I'm just going to, you know, <laughs> slap myself, I'm going to say, okay? Because it's not new normal. America has always had things, challenges happen. We had, you know, we had our, our country attacked. And everybody said, oh, we'll never see anything like this. It's devastating. Yes, it was very, very devastating. But what happened? We got back up on our feet, and we went on with our lives. So to me, yes, this is very devastating. But it's not a, a new way. It's, it's, we will get through this, too. But we got to get people back to work. That's the biggest thing. So is that what you're hearing out there? That's, that's it. People want to go back to work. The, the, the problem is with the stimulus package, it's kind of created a little bit of a perverse incentive. Mm. You've got people that are staying at home because they're making more money at home. And the employers right. are saying, even if I wanted to open my shops, my people aren't coming back to work. So we've got to look at that. But more important than that, we're seeing for the first time suburbs being attacked. Right. We have not seen suburbs being attacked. We're seeing it on TV. We're seeing it in our own, in our own state. And, th and that, frankly, is, is scaring people. And this is something that transcends parties. This has to do with people that want their children to be safe. And I say this all the time. There are three things that we want. We want safe communities for our children to grow up in. We want safe communities, period. And for that, you have to have law and order. We want good schools. Everybody wants good schools. And everybody wants to be able to earn a living wage, to be able to take care of their family because that makes them feel good. Those are the things, and they're very simple. 
and they transcend both parties. This is not a Republican idea. This is not a Democratic idea. This is an idea that I don't think anybody out there can disagree with, that that's what people want. And that's what I'm hearing. So there's so many people. I know that they talked about you know defunding the police and so forth, and I know that my opponent has been an advocate of that, and he uses the word reallocate, and that's just a fancy schmancy word for defunding, because uh, that's what that means. Well, I think we have a clip right. of that. Yeah, as I was going to say, I, 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 I think we did, yeah. Let's hang on, so... Uh, well, let's go to the video feed. <laughs> Let me cue that up. Yeah, we do. So this is Jake on an interview with, I believe... Uh, who is it with? Do you know who you happen to know? I do know it. All right. Well, let's, let's find out what this Jake has to say. I think is incredibly exciting. It's, going to, it's going to be one of the hallmarks of public policy. Well, can you back it up to the beginning? Century, sure. And I, I think it's going to be adopted nationwide. Maybe. The experiment that Minneapolis has embarked upon, I think, is incredibly exciting. It's, going to, it's going to be one of the hallmarks of public policy in the 21st century. And I, I think it's going to be adopted nationwide. And it's going to be adopted by cities and towns, figuring out what aspects of it work and what aspects okay. they need to tweak. That's and that's a project that's already underway in Newton. As the chair of public safety, uh, I helped quarterback the independent police reform task force for us to re-examine through the lens of racial justice what we want out of public safety. The experiment that Minneapolis... So the does, experiment in Minneapolis, just to give some back, a, background excited. to the audience, the experiment in Minneapolis, uh, they... The city council defunded the police. And right or, or, now, or they tried to. They, well, in some aspects, they were successful. And right. right now, there's community activists that are absolutely losing their mind because violent crime has spiked so bad right. I in, mean, the, in the Minneapolis yeah, area. Yeah, the, the New York Times did an article like three weeks ago why the Minneapolis experiment has failed. Correct. I mean, it's not like it's... Failed over a six-year time frame. It, it's been a couple of weeks. It, it, it's yeah. They yeah. They got second. It started rolling. It started failing. Yeah, and and so you can see. So this is this is exactly what I'm talking about. Is you know this is a you know a, an exciting. That's it's dangerous. Okay, and I you know it was a dangerous experiment. It was I don't even want to call it an experiment. It was a bad decision. Period to begin with. Who would have thought about defunding the police? But I'm going to take it a step further. You know, and what I see, so here we go, we start defunding the police, and then we start looting and burning. And now you've got nobody to protect you. You know, is that just a concept? You know, is that just a coincidence? There's people there that would say, and I'd say it too, that there are people out there that are trying to move us very quickly from progressiveness to socialism. Oh, uh, absolutely. I mean, there's, I, I don't think there's any question on that whatsoever you know one of the things i was bringing up to a good friend of mine who's very liberal uh the other day and he's like i'm like all right so defunding the police he goes yep you know he's big into defunding the police i'm like remember last year when you were really big into taking away second amendment rights and people didn't need their guns because we have the police <laughs> and like, if you have a problem and someone's breaking your in your house just call the police they'll take care of it now you're telling me that one, we're going to defund the tr police, and two, the police are such bad guys, I shouldn't be calling them because they're all, you know, if I'm a black guy, you know, they're racially insensitive and they're not going to help me. So at the very least, shouldn't we make sure that, you know, people of color that, and are Hispanics and people are minorities that are being, you know, supposedly, you know, attacked by the police? You're also taking away their right to bear arms? I don't like that just doesn't That doesn't make any sense. Make any sense. I think it's, if you're looking for anything to make sense Well, no, no, I mean but 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 it was but it was interesting and, and he was very stymied. He's like, Well, that's different. And I'm like no, how it's how, how it's different. You I mean, don't get to pick and choose. That's you, you, correct. Exactly. I mean, are you only taking away the Second Amendment rights and eliminating it for white people? Correct. No. Okay. Well, correct. Uh, the, the two don't and, and mesh let up. Me take this, let me even take it to something even much more devastating than I think. A lot of the people of color, the people of different sexual orientations, have just recently made it on to the police forces and the fire departments, and how wonderful they must feel. And I remember coming up the ranks, how wonderful I felt, how much of a challenge it was. But my family was so proud of me. 
Can you imagine these people that are on these police forces right now? You're going to defund the police. Who the heck do you think is going to go? Oh, exactly. Yeah, okay? recruiting so, problem. So did you think, here, here's the difficulty that I, I find, and I'm going to call it downrange thinking. I find that the progressives don't do a lot of downrange thinking. There's not much thought process that goes into things at all, as far as I'm concerned. And what that means is they don't think about the collateral damage, about what's going to happen. Mail-in voting, perfect example. Did you talk to the post office? Had, did you have a discussion with the Postal Service to see if this is something that they could handle? Obviously not. So that was very poor planning. Right. No, and, they, they did, and, and I know as a former clerk, they didn't talk to the clerks either. And you know, it, it, it was, but these are the sort of things, you know, it's all done, it's all emotion-based governance. And you can't govern by emotion. I mean, it's, you, you need to have empathy and you need to have understanding and you need to have compassion. But you also have to be able to look at it and say, all right, let's look at it from a, a pragmatic standpoint. If we do X, Let's play. Let's 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 play not just out. do it. Yep. Let's let's t sit around in a room and say, all right, let's you know, let's play some devil's advocate. Let's say, all right, what if this happens? And we, oh, oh, I hadn't thought about that. Well, we should probably you know change this, you know, tweak this a little bit. But the the problem we have in our state and and, and in Congress now is everyone is so polarized that nope, this is my way. This is the progressive way. We're if you touch it, it's you, yeah. you've, you've ruined it. So we're, we're not going to have that conversation. Can I ask you a question for both of you? Actually, I mean, your your districts overlap. You there's a lot of Democrats in your district. There are Democrats who are going to be going to be voting for you, Julie, and there's Democrats that do and are going to vote for you, Sean. Do they see? Or are they beginning to see the divide within their Absolutely. own party as far as progressive versus just? practical maybe you know they just grew up in a democratic household and they voted d a lot right. uh so that that because in order to get elected into any large district you're going to need democrat votes so oh i, I, I mean I, you it, what, what's the level of they've had enough or enough. <laughs> or or they're just like no nah, not this time i'm not voting party line the whole way no, no, what are just, you seeing I, I, I should be i see a lot of old school jfk Mm. You know, Kennedy Democrats, and you know, they, and, and they're blue collar, and they want you know a better life for themselves and their kids. That's who they, you know, most of the Democrats I know, and you know, and a lot of them are cops, a lot of them are firefighters, a lot of right. them are union guys, union people. and yeah. and they're, they're like, whoa, 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 that's you know, I'm a Democrat because I believe in these sort of protections for the middle class and and to make sure that everyone has a fair share. Socialism is very different. Absolutely, and and I think they're, they're the the move of the Democratic Party, especially in Massachusetts, because we don't have a strong Republican Party to challenge them and to and to hold the center, is they are drastically abandoning the center because you know the far left has a lot of money. It's become popular. It's kind of in vogue. You know, they they've got a lot of people on Twitter and it's yeah. you know, things along those lines and it's and it, and it and we have the media that spurs it on and it makes it sound you know this is where the country is going the reality is most Massachusetts people Republican Democrat young old or whatever are for the most part still pretty Yankee they yeah. still they still you know you know I don't mind helping other people right. and and you know and spending a little more on my taxes to make sure every you know a rising tide raises all boats but I don't want to throw it away. I don't want to give it away. And I don't want to non-incentivize hard work. I mean, I, I, I want to be able to, you know, you should still be able to have the American dream. You work hard, nose to the grindstone, you study hard, you know, you, know, you, you put, it all, put it all out there. There, sh there should be a reward for that. And I, and I think that's, you know, everyone gets a trophy mentality that has really uh, become pervasive uh, in the Democratic Party has really started to take hold and I think the middle is getting abandoned. I agree, totally. And I'm hearing the same thing about people abandoning their jumping ship is what we're saying because they're saying, okay, this is not what we signed up for. 
And again, the Democratic Party has changed. If, you know, I say if JFK had been around now, he'd probably be a Republican or be considered a Republican for the ideas. He, he sure as hell wouldn't win a Democratic primary. That's, nope. that's for sure. Nope. And, and I think so people are, um, there's a lot of things if you look at when you say, how, come, how can I win this seat? There are a lot of things that are kind of going in my favor right now or in the favor of, of a Republican or a more conservative person. I can tell you that there's people out there. I've, I've reached out to a lot of clergy. I've reached out to the Jewish community who are petrified right now. They've come to me and said, we see anti-Semitism rights. We're seeing what happened before the Nazis came in. I said, I, they're, that's... Really? Where are they? That, they are that's, that afraid. Wow. They are that afraid. Uh, I did an interview with a 92-year-old woman who just loves me because she said, you get it. You get it. And I said, well, tell me, what do, what do you mean? She said, this is what happened right before. They changed the national anthem, she said. Hmm. They turned overnight the Boy Scouts into the junior SS. Brainwashed them, I'm thinking. And just listening to her talk and what she talked to me about, I just thought to myself, oh my gosh, I can see why she's afraid. So, and then, that's not the only one. I had a, a Russian woman come to me, and she said, this is what it looked like before the fascists came in. So I have a lot of people that are coming from this country, are coming to this country, that are new immigrants to this country, if you would, that are a little bit upset right now because they came to this country because of the values of the United States. That's what they came. They didn't come to become a socialist country. They didn't become to become a fascist country. That is what they left. They came here to the United States because they felt that this was a country with the American dream. They loved our constitution. You know, there are countries that, well, that I don't know if there's another country that has a constitution like we have, but there's very few countries that have a constitution that gives people what they call an inalienable, and I actually had to look that up. Inalienable means that you have those rights. Nobody has to give those to you. They say God-given. You know, and even if you're not a religious person, what that means is these are rights that you do not have to fight for. Now, what does Congress do? What does the legislation do? When we find that there are people that aren't being afforded those rights because those are the most important thing that we can lay our hat on in the United States of America, it is up to us to ensure that every citizen has equal access to the rights that are given to them. And when they aren't getting them, that's when we make legislation. That's when we make legislation to change things for them. And I think we have done an exceptional job in America to try to right those wrongs for the, for the people that haven't had them. Me, as a woman, I would never have been able to vote. I would never have been able to go into the military if it wasn't for the people in the United States saying, we need to give the women the right to vote. We need to make sure that people are not discriminated against. So I, don't want, I, I find it very, dis, very uh, disturbing, I'll say that, when people say we have done nothing and we have systemic racism and we have systemic sexism. I mean, I could say we have systemic, systemic sexism, okay? I'm not saying that. I'm saying that this is a country, one of the only countries, that allows us to make those changes, that demands for us to make those changes, and it's the best country in the world. Well, people often confuse flaws within the system as something that's a part of the system. And incidentally, the examples you just gave the system corrected the flaws. So we have a system that corrects the flaws rather than something that embeds them and it becomes something like systemic racism, which is rejectable on its face because when we find out about it, we fix it. Maybe not right away, as our history shows, but definitely when we, when we know about a, a problem, we, that's the beauty of our, of our, uh, our Constitution and the way uh, America was set up is that we give that, give ourselves that opportunity. Exactly. And, and, and I think that's one of the things that you know we really need to get back to as a country is you know get rid of this groupthink, get rid of this cancel culture. You know, 
go. Someone made a mistake. I mean, you know, it, you, you you see these people getting dragged for, you know, something stupid they did when they were 16 years old. I, we all did stupid things at 16 years old. I'm so glad it's, social media wasn't no, around when no I was kidding. 16. <laughs> but because that's, 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 that's how you, but that's how you learn. That's how you yeah. grow. That's how you, you learn from your mistakes. You make, you do stupid things and you mature. If you're still doing the stupid things when you're in 30 and 40, different story. Okay, Obviously you yeah. didn't learn, but you can't say, all right, we're going to cancel you because you misspoke or you said something that was insensitive, but you didn't mean it in an insensitive way. And all of this stuff, it's just this gotcha culture. Absolutely. Of, you know, and, and, it's, and, and if you're not pure, none of us are. If you're not pure, they're going to eventually come for you. And the people that embrace this, you're just like, you better be really careful because sooner or later, coming they're for coming you. for you. That's right. And I think people are realizing that. And again, I'm going to go back to reality and what people are seeing on TV. Graphically, they're coming for the middle class. They're coming for the suburbs. People are seeing that. And, and women in particular. And I'm, I had a gut feeling again. I had a lot of my friends, women friends, they asked me to write a reference for them so they can get their license to carry. And Interesting. I had, and I had a gut feeling that there's on the rise women going to get their license to carry and be able to, because they want to protect their children. You know, women are very, <laughs> you know, we're very ferocious when it comes to the, that, uh, and, I, and men are too, but I think uh, women. Uh, oh, no, no. No, not you, the same. You, you've met, you met my wife. You met Jeff's wife. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We, we know women are way stronger and way more ferocious than... Yeah, yeah, That's I, what I you should say. see my wife argue with me. It's not, not even a I, I, my wife. You can see my wife argue with me. It lasts about three seconds, and I just yeah. I realized I, I, I lost. You know, women are... They're going to be the protectors. They're right. the protectors. And, and a lot of people are saying that's why it's a really good thing that women are going to Congress because we are going to protect and defend, and all of those things. And, and I think women have a natural uh, partnership, if you would, with law enforcement. Right. Because that's what law enforcement did. And, and actually, it, that just came up in my head right now. But I think that's why there is a, a natural reaction to say, wait a minute, let's not. Because if they're not around, somebody else has to do it. Right, yeah. And then, then we have chaos. Then exactly. we have chaos. We put a police force together. We put law enforcement. We put community people together to do that job. The same reason why we have a military. You have people in the military go out and fight the wars for you. We pay people to do that for us because we can't have everybody going out and doing it. Not everybody wants to go do it. And God bless, God bless the people that go and do that for, this, for their country. But you have to realize that that's what we do. We have these groups of people that do these things for us as a civil society. Think about way back in the day of the colonial. They had to fight for themselves. Right. It was yep. every, every man, every woman for themselves. And thank goodness we've evolved in some ways. We've evolved to the point where we have organizations now that do those things. So it's kind of an interesting society. And, and why do we do that? Because it's, it's civil. It's a civil way. It's, it's, it's a non-chaotic way of doing things. Is it always right all the time? Absolutely, absolutely not. But the alternative to that is, you know, going back to when there's fighting. There are people out there that believe that there is an underbelly group that wants us to fight with each other. Right. They're hoping that we do. And you know what? We're not going to. We're not going to let that happen. I think uh, the bottom line, and I tell people all the time, I don't, I don't agree, and I don't want to see this country go to socialism, but at the same time, we are, going, we are not going to engage with each other because that's what they want us to do. Just a little light on, on Julie. Like it. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm getting on my... We need a new power strip. <laughs> that's right. At minute 59. I think we're... Uh, I, I know, it's probably believe my foot just keeps rolling on it. There we go. We'll fix that permanently. <coughs> so, so, you know, both of you are in the midst of the campaign. Days to go. 
what is your sense out there from the overall electorate? Um, you know, we've, we've, we've talked a little bit about coronavirus, a little bit about public safety, police and crime and, and what's going on there. Are people optimistic or sad or hopeful or what's, what's the mood? Frightened. Yeah, I, 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 I would say the people that are engaged are frightened. And, but for the first time ever, I've seen so many people disengaged. They're like, they're, they're, afraid. they're like, I don't want to look at politics. I don't want to talk politics because no matter what happens, if I bring up an opinion, a question, or anything like that, somebody from one side or the other jumps all over me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, beco it becomes this battle, and oh, you know, you're a racist, you're a Nazi, you're a, you're a, you're a liberal, you're a, you're, a, you're a conservative. He's like, no, I'm just having a conversation as a human being, and we've lost that. We've lost the ability for friends and neighbors to just be able to have a conversation, because like, like Julie said, the truth is always in the middle anyways. You, right. you get more people in, together, and they work things out. We're gonna have a better solution. But You're an, an amazing, resilient people we are and we are that way because of our constitution and because of our history and one of the things you know i used to brag about massachusetts when i was in the military i used to say this is the place where freedom began and it began because people were fighting for their right to keep their arms the bare arms and I come back and I said, what the heck happened to my, my state of Massachusetts? Um, that's the other thing, the pride. This state needs to really understand how other people look at it, how other people look at us. And to be so unbalanced, see that? The, 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 dogs, the, dogs, the dogs are very upset about <laughs> the unbalanced of, of Massachusetts. If we could get Massachusetts balanced again, I, I truly believe the country would see that because we were one of the first. So, you know, why not, why not here in Massachusetts? This would be the place to start it. Agreed. Well, I'm, the audience is going to get a little listener. Ooh. Oh, All right. it's, it's Friday night. It's beer o'clock. Exactly. We have we have been had the pleasure of sitting down with the wonderful, uh, I say the the excellent, uh, the very well informed, accomplished Colonel Julie Hall. Oh, oh be before you do this, before Ooh. you start cranking up the music, let's make sure we get her website out there. Oh, yes, because we we still want to make information out there. She's got 10 days left. We still want to, if, right. if you have a few dollars so she can continue to blast out the message, please donate. This well, is important. If you can volunteer for Julie Hall, if you can contribute to her campaign, what is the website, Julie? It is Hall for Congress. Hall for Hall Congress. Hall. Is it Hall F-O-R? Hall F-O-R. For Hall. Congress. Hallforcongress.com. Please go to that website. Please check it out. Contribute if you can. Volunteer if you can. She needs the support. She Her district overlaps with Sean's. I know he needs the support. So if you are in one of those overlapping districts, definitely knock on some doors. Help drive out the vote for both of these great candidates that are, uh, I'd say, right where they, we need to be as a state. I am Jeff Simone. He is Sean Dooley. And we are the Commonwealth Conservative Podcast. Anything you'd like to close with, Sean? I, I think I think you did a phenomenal job. Yeah, yeah. As, Today's as, one of my... as, as, as always, you got the beer going. <laughs> we had, we had a great time. Thank uh, Colonel Hall. Thank you very much for being thank here. You for I know me. how swamped you are, and you're just you're you're running running ragged twenty four seven. So I really appreciate you, know you taking the time. You run where, you run ragged when you know it's the right thing to do. It's She's awesome. doing the right thing. Thank you. Uh, Massachusetts owes her thanks. We owe her thanks. And you are listening and watching the Commonwealth Conservative Podcast. Have a great night.